My name is David Thorpe and I am the Special Consultant on Sustainable Cities Collective, the foremost web space for urban leaders everywhere. Cities in the developing world are growing and changing rapidly. Without appropriate planning, they will become increasingly chaotic, inefficient and unsustainable. There is a shortage of trained urban planning and management professionals. Somebody who has made a special study of this is Vanessa Watson, the Professor of City Planning in the School of Architecture, Planning and Geomatics at Cape Town University. She's interested in the effects of inappropriate planning practices and theories, especially in Africa. Besides writing 50 journal articles, her book, Change and Continuity in Spatial Planning, Metropolitan Planning in Cape Town under Political Transition, has won many plaudits. She was also the lead consultant for UN Habitat's 2009 Global Report on Planning Sustainable Cities. Welcome, Vanessa. Good morning, David. Let's first look at the problem. Can you give us examples of bad practice in city planning in the South that you have recently come across? Well, examples of bad practice which I have uh, been particularly concerned with, and uh, these are bad practices in uh, across the African continent, but examples can be found in India, in other parts of Asia, and probably Latin America as well. Um, are new ideas of, of future cities, um, many of which take the form of new completely planned satellite cities um, around the older existing cities. And Africa has, has had a number of these in the last um, few years. And what planners seem to be doing, um, planners, architects, engineers, is is, is suggesting that we should abandon the existing cities, abandon them to their fate, and set up whole new cities on the outskirts. Um, a bit like we used to do back in the 1940s and 50s, Brasilia, Chandigarh, and so on. We, we sort of back to that. Uh, with, and we need to learn lessons from the failures of those past efforts. Um, I think there's, a, there's another tendency that I'm seeing, and this is more often happening within existing cities. And, of course, many cities of the South um, have a growing transport problem and traffic congestion is, is a key issue for many people, many cities. But the response then again is, um, is, is usually build more freeways. And, of course, if you build more freeways, more cars come. Um, that's, that's a lesson that we know from the past as well. So, not enough cities are thinking about public transport, um, thinking about how people without a car can get around, people on foot. Um, given that these cities are largely made up of people who are poor and don't have a car. So, those are two examples of bad planning practices. Can you demonstrate the scale of the problem? How many cities in Africa and how many inhabitants would you say are affected by this tendency? Um, the, the, these new plans that I've been talking about seem to be taking place largely within the, the capital cities or the main cities of each country. Um, in the case of Africa, there are many much smaller um, secondary cities and we're seeing less of these bad practices there. We're seeing very little planning, in fact, in those secondary cities, but it's, it's the largest cities, so it's the Lagos um, it's uh, Nairobi, it's Dar es Salaam, it's Kigali, it's Addis, uh, and I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. um, if, as you say, planning is the single most important tool that governments have for managing rapid urban population growth, how can we ensure that planners have the correct skills? Well, the, the most important influence there, of course, is, is planning education. Um, and uh, in Africa, but in other parts of the global south as well, um, planning education is often very outdated, um, sometimes still inherited from colonial times, often curricula based on uh, British or American models that are completely inappropriate uh, in a global south situation. So we have to get planning education changed dramatically so that uh, students actually learn something about the cities which they live in and not British garden cities or American new towns or, or, or so. And then of course there are the, the planners who are in practice and we have to think about, um, uh, about uh, continuing professional development 
um, additional courses, if you like, for those who are already working. How can we then get these people to learn from the mistakes that we in the developed world have already made? Well, I think it's a, it's an important point to to drive home, and, and there's a tendency, I'm afraid, um, which has been there for many decades, to assume that uh, planning um, efforts in the global north are always better, and they're the right ones. So there's always an attempt to to argue that uh, planners in the global south don't know enough, and they must learn from the global north. Um, and inevitably, they not only do they learn the mistakes of the global north, but they also learn lessons that simply can't be applied in the very, very different context of the global south. And I'm not saying there's there's nothing that's transferable, um, but many of the ideas uh, that have informed planning in the global north are based on a whole lot of assumptions that don't hold in the global south. I mean, for example, an assumption that you have a, a very strong, well-capacitated um, system of local governance, uh, which very often doesn't happen in, in, the, local, in the global south. So, so we we need to we need to develop new ideas, new perspectives um, that are appropriate to our very distinct and different global south conditions. But do you think, in addition, that uh, a big problem is that municipal authorities in most of these cities in the developing world are engaged in crisis management and looking for quick fixes? They can't even collect their local taxes efficiently in many cases. No, that is that is a huge problem. Um, the extent to which decentralization of, <clears throat> of power and responsibilities has happened uh, in, in many Global South countries is, is still very, very limited. Um, authority often still lies with the, the national government and that is enshrined in, in law, in, in national law and in planning law. So it's very difficult for municipalities to, um, to have the power to actually try innovative mechanisms to, um, to try different ways of, of, of planning, of raising revenue, of dealing with local problems. So, so we need, um, we need decentralization, but it needs to come along with um, resources and human capacity. And what do you think should be considered the, the true attitude that planners and city managers should take towards shanty towns or informal settlements? Okay, well, I feel quite strongly about this one. Um, if you have a look at, uh, at, at cities in sub-Saharan Africa, um, somewhere between 62 and 72 percent of urban populations um, live in informal settlements. In other words, they are the norm, they're not the exception. Um, and far too many governments, national and local, believe that um, they can simply marginalize uh, shack dwellers, um, uproot them, shunt them out of the city, and the problem will go away. Um, this has been a, a, a particular tendency in Africa with the new modernization efforts attached to these new plans that are, that are coming on stream. So, so the notion um, which many international agencies are now promoting of inclusive cities, of equitable cities, um, does not seem to be entering the discourse of, of other planners or national governments at all. I mean, in Africa there's, there's still a very strong anti-urban sentiment. Um, amongst many politicians, and a desire really to see shack dwellers, as they would say, go back to the rural areas and, and not come to the cities and cause a problem. So there's a big change of mindsets that has to happen, both about the inevitability of urbanization and also the fact that if you, if you have an economy that's not providing jobs um, and people don't have an income, then they will have to live in shacks. There really is no alternative. Can you think of any examples of uh, shanty towns and informal settlements that are being taken seriously and, and supported by a local authority or national government? Yeah, look, uh, Brazil is, has some of, some better examples. In there. I mean, Brazil is in many senses uh, a leader uh, in terms of um, thinking and planning planning action around inclusive cities, and there are a lot of really good ideas that have come out of, of Brazil. Um, and I think here in the Global South, other parts of the Global South, um, we do need to look at those examples and they, they can be instructive. 
If we're looking in Africa, it's very difficult to find, other than a few small scattered samples of, of informal upgrades that have happened. Um, in South Africa, there's now a new national policy that accepts uh, informal settlement upgrade, but we have yet to see it actually come down onto the ground. Um, so we have a long way to go. It's hard to point to examples at this point in time. And to what extent is the is land tenure and land ownership and, and the value of land uh, a factor as cities expand? Um, I'm thinking, I mean, those examples you gave of developers looking hungrily at land around capital cities in Africa, they're looking to make a quick buck, aren't they? Absolutely, of course they are. Um, the whole question of land tenure, and particularly in Africa, is, is fraught. Because in many cities you get a combination of customary land tenure um, as well as uh, what we might call more modern forms of land tenure, freehold and so on. And, uh, and the, the two are often coexist uh, in cities. So this makes any form of, of development difficult. We have to, to recognize this. But there does seem to be a new scramble for well-located urban land. Um, certainly in Africa, certainly in India, other parts of, of the East. And it's really, it's the private sector, it's the developers who are winning out in the scramble for well-located land. But in that, they, they're in direct competition with, um, with poor people, with shack dwellers, who also want to be in well-located land because they need to have access to jobs and facilities and so on. So it's, it's a battle, it's a conflict. Um, the poor are losing out at the moment. Uh, national politicians have this dream of, of supposedly modernizing their cities. Um, that dream often means they want to make them look like Dubai or Shanghai. Um, and, and the poor are not part of that. Those, those visions of cities don't have shacks. They don't have informal traders. They don't even have public transport, many of them. So land is important, yeah. So given the huge scale of the problem, is there anything that those with more experience uh, from cities in the developed world, like um, C40 Group of Mayors and UN Habitat, is there anything that they can do to help bring strong leadership to these cities? I think leadership comes from within. Um, it's hard for uh, it to come from elsewhere. Um, UN Habitat is certainly developing uh, a lot of very good ideas about, um, uh, about sustainable cities in the Global South, um, recognizing that planning is, is a key tool in order to, to achieve that. So I suppose what we, what we can learn from the, the Global North is, uh, is something about the importance of planning, um, something about the strength of planning and the need to take it seriously rather than, than any uh, specific models or urban forms that might come from that part of the world. Well, thank you very much for talking to us, Vanessa. And uh, details about how you can obtain her book will be available um, in one moment. Thank you, David. Thank you, Vanessa. And there'll be a link to further information in just one moment. Okay, thank you very much. Bye, David.